Okay, uh, welcome everybody. So great to see some names pop up that we're familiar with and also some new, some new ones as well. <clears throat> so welcome to our inaugural Women in Sarcoma event. My name is Sarah Rothschild. I'm the VP of Program Services at the Life Raft Group. <clears throat> We have an interactive panel of experts from different areas within the field, and we are so excited to have them join us today. First, I wanna thank Dr. Gina D'Amato, who's a medical oncologist at Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. Gina helped inspire this session as she has gathered her female colleagues at medical conferences these past couple of years. And it was such a great turnout that we thought, oh, why not we share these wonderful women with our uh, sarcoma community? So we're excited to have her as a moderator today. And I'd also like to welcome the panelists. So we have Dr. Marion Brody, who's a radiologist at Mercy Fitzgerald and Mercy Philadelphia Hospitals. Dr. Amy Crago, who's a surgeon at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Annette Dunsing, Associate Professor of Pathology at the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute. Dr. Suzanne George, Medical Oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Tracy Havner, a registered nurse at Oregon Health and Science University Knight Cancer Institute. Marlene Morales, a licensed clinical social worker at Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. And lastly, Dr. Nita Samaya, a medical oncologist at MD Anderson Cancer Center. So uh, we're so excited to have these panelists here today and we really wanna make this interactive. Uh, but before we get started, we like to do a, a quick poll today to get a sense of who has joined us. So hopefully you'll see a poll pop up on your screen and I'll just read these questions for you and you can feel free to mark the answers um, right now. So first, are you a patient, caregiver or other? Next, um, please share if you're a patient or caregiver of the following diseases. Uh, we have listed GIST, sarcoma liposarcoma, angiosarcoma, and other. We do recognize there are many other sarcoma types. <laughs> but, um, and then the last fun question is, we are in the fall season, so please share with us what is your most favorite fall family activity? Pumpkin picking, apple picking, hay rides, house of horrors, spooky stuff, pumpkin carving, decorating the outside of your house nice fall walk or something else or nothing at all. So we'll wait a few minutes for you to fill out this poll. And then we'll share the answers with everybody. Okay. Let's see. If you can pull up the answers. Okay. Okay. Well, we got 53% that are patients, a smaller percent that are caregiver, and that there happens to be a lot of others out here. I think there's some medical colleagues from some of the panelists in, so maybe they count as the other. Okay, so we got um, most of the people, about ha half are just, we got some leiomyosarcoma, and then there's some others. Uh-oh, what happened to our third polling question? <laughs> oh, it's, it's there. It looks I like most nice people fall. like to take walks. <laughs> Can't blame you. It's nice weather, <laughs> but we got some hay rides in there, decorating the outside of your house and other. Okay, maybe fall isn't so much your season. We'll have to make an excuse to do some um, some events in other seasons throughout the year. <laughs> um, I'm gonna have Laura uh, say a few words and then we'll hand it off to, to Dr. D'Amato. Okay, I guess we're a little biased here in the Northeast as my whole front porch has mums and pumpkins on it. Um, 
we'll have to do something uh, you know, to reflect warm weather. Thank you everyone for joining today. I am so excited uh, to have all of these amazing women in one place and uh, so grateful that Sarah and Diana Nieves, um, our Director of Outreach and Engagement, um, are, are bringing this program here today. And we're looking forward to continuing the conversations over the next few months and into next year. So with that, I uh, also want to thank Dr. D'Amato. Um, this was our idea in the beginning to bring all these women together um, after events. And we're just excited to continue the conversations. Dr. D'Amato, I'll send it back to you. Okay, well, again, I'm really excited about our event. And thanks for hosting this. I really appreciate it. Just want to not take full credit. There was a, a, a handful of, of women um, that were, were interested in having a group and I just tend to be the social coordinator. So just call me, uh, you know, uh, uh, Julie, the cruise director, social director. So, um, so just want to start, um, first of all, uh, let's start with some female, female mentors. Um, does anyone have any female mentors? Um, some of us are in various generations where we might've been first first of the women pioneers in, in sarcoma, but some of us are a little bit younger. And so I wanted to find out if anybody has a female mentor and if they can talk about that person. Um, so why don't we start with um, Dr. Samaya. Well, um, I think uh, my career, I've been very lucky uh, to have a female mentor who is a sarcoma specialist. Uh, so I think, the, you know, the person I'd like to talk about is uh, Margaret Von Marin at Fox Chase. That's where I did my fellowship at. Um, and, you know, I've had a lot of mentors all through my career and, uh, you know, including male mentors and female mentors that have shaped uh, the decisions I made all along my career. But Meg Von Marin was, you know, I think the key person to drive me into academic oncology because I was kind of at that threshold of making a decision. As in my third year of fellowship, I had a baby. And then I had her as a role model who managed work-life balance really amazingly, was very successful in her career front, uh, but also was able to keep time. You know, she was able to come on time and leave on time. And, uh, you know, I've met her family, a very, you know, two young boys uh, and a wonderful husband. So I think that was kind of key in making me see that you know you could have a very balanced life but still achieve a lot in academics and i think you know definitely a shout out to her okay what about anybody else uh dr krako yeah. i always mispronounce amy's name <laughs> you know, i don't know what it is about it's krago it's like five were five letters and for some reason i know it's not a normal name no <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I, in surgery, you know, we, we have historically had fewer female mentors, but I, I think it's always, it's very, it's been very important to me because, I mean, as, at Memorial, we're pretty lucky because um, Monica Morrow and Valerie Roosh are both, you know, very senior surgeons here. Dr. Roosh is in charge of the American College of Surgeons, which is our version of ASCO, and, and having them around to be able to bounce ideas off or or when I, I don't understand something um, has been phenomenally helpful throughout from the time I was at fellowship to, to now even when I'm having a bad day, I'm, I'm really quite likely to call Dr. Mora when things get really, really out of control. So, and, and they can always put things in perspective and help me understand all points of view and, and really make steps forward. So it's having, having them around has been very helpful. What about anybody else want to give a shout out to their mentor or um, talk about um, some lessons that took away from them? I'm happy to speak. I'm Marion Brody. Um, I actually had the opportunity to work with Meg Von Maren for 10 years. She is really uh, inspiring. But actually, I'm going to say my mother. My mother's a federal judge, and she just taught me sort of um, professionalism and uh, empathy and collaboration, which I think women are really good at. And that's really um, has been an inspiration for me. Okay. I want to put um, Suzanne on the spot because Suzanne and I started around the same time. And we only, I think we had uh, Dr. Uh, Cohen and Dr. Um, 
Von Marin were uh, uh, helping out, but uh, do you have any female mentors or were most of your mentors male? Um, so I, you know, I always considered my two primary mentors as uh, George Dimitri, who um, is extremely and exceedingly supportive of um, really every aspect of my professional development, work-life balance. I mean, he's just, I've been so fortunate to work with him for my career. Um, and then the other person that I always turn to is Monica Bertinoli who is, um, you know, really an amazing um, woman in medicine. She's achieved so much and, um, you know, as a surgical oncologist, as a leader in ASCO, as um, really a, a leader in research. And, and it's, she wears so many hats, um, but also is somebody that has a really very strong and, you um, uh, rooted uh, family connection. And I feel very fortunate that I've been able to, to work with both of them and have both of them sort of help me in navigating the world of academic medicine, <laughs> which is an adventure at times. <laughs> I'll go ahead and, and type in here. <laughs> yes. Um, I would like two people that have that come to mind for me. The first one is, is a nurse that I worked with. Her name is Deirdre Nauman. She's retired now. Um, but my background was in cardiac intensive care. And then I sort of made the leap into oncology and research. And it was, you know, nursing is a little bit different maybe that way than some physicians in that um, we don't have a fellowship and then pick a specialty necessarily. We can sometimes make some transitions, but to go from cardiac intensive care to oncology and research um, was a huge uh, learning curve. <laughs> so um, she was really able to mentor me and do a lot of teaching and, and bear with me when I you know, didn't have a clue about some of the oncology language um, nor the research language. So, so that was really inspiring. And I guess I would add to that that um, I don't know if I do it well, but I try to um, you know, pass that on to other uh, females coming after me um, knowing that I couldn't be here and doing what I'm doing if I had not had someone do that for me. Um, and then, of course, the other person at OHSU that I highly respect is Mike Heinrich. Um, and he's just sort of the constant, you know, we do things the right way. We report everything. We, you know, plan to get people here and follow the protocols. And just his ethics and um, the quality, it's just, it rubs off on everyone that is on our team. So... Okay, and just I just also want to remind that um, the uh, the audience can also ask questions, and so we have some questions that we've prepared. But of course, you guys are welcome to to ask us anything, and I'll I'll, I'll uh, you know ask those questions as they come in. So far, we don't have any uh, questions coming in, so of course that's why we made up some questions. So. Let's start with some of the oncologists. We'll put them on the spot. Okay. <laughs> let's see. I mean, we're all oncologists, but the medical oncologists, so to speak. Okay. So let's see. Um, we, I think that, um, you know, Nita, you already talked about, you know, the, how do you practice juggling medicine, researching, family life, kind of uh, touched on that. Um, but uh, it sounds like, um, uh, um, you know, you're, you're able to do it. Do you, do you feel, uh, how do you feel about that? Do you feel like you're not doing enough? Do you feel like you are having it? Uh, you know, tell me about it. You know, that that's kind of, I don't know if the others feel the same, but um, there's kind of a growing sense of uh, never being able to, you know, do whatever I want to do or do it as well as I want. And, you know, the funny thing is, you know, when you start an internship uh, and fellowship, you know, residency fellowship, you know, you think you're so busy and, when I think of myself right now, I'm like, God, I mean, it just gets busier, you know, I mean, it's, you know, young kids, older kids, you know, home life. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just amazing. And, you know, you've got to, of course, time management. I mean, obviously, I'm sure all of us are, have figured out our time management skills, but you also have to learn to, you know, it's been tough to give up a few things, you know, you, you know, you feel at one point that you can do it all, you know, you can be that you know, the greatest doctor and give your all to the patients and then want to do research and then want to do, you know, pursue all your ideas and then, uh, you know, want to be there for your kid and make sure they're doing well. 
too. And then, you know, you realize, you know, when you start doing all of that, you kind of go a little crazy. So then you have to dial back. And then I think what's been really interesting is as I have gone through is saying that, look, I know my limitations and I make my list and I try to live in the moment of what I'm doing and do it really well and not stress about the 10 different things that I haven't done. And, you know, it's just been, uh, you know, that's the only way to do what we do and still get, you know, decent hours of sleep at night. So um, that's, that's, I think, you know, and I derive inspiration from all the women I see around me all the time. <laughs> so that's good. Well, we have a lot of patients uh, as attendees. So I'm going to ask Dr. George, how do you think, do you, do you, do you find like that some, um, uh, you know, that you have specific women patients wanting to go to you because you're a woman or also how do you feel like the, do you, do you feel, do you see a difference in how a woman handles their news or their cancer versus the men? Uh, do you see that in your patients or you think it's just per the disease or per the personality or you've seen that? I think that's kind of a really loaded question. question. It's a loaded I think, question. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, um, I think if I reflect on my own patient panel over the years, I tend to see more women than men. And I don't know if that's sort of a conscious selection by the patients or not. For many years, I was the only woman in my group. So, um, you know, if, if somebody did feel more connected to a female provider, just they would just get me because I was the only one. Um, I think that it's really up to the, I think it's a personality, you know, it's, it's really what each person feels most comfortable with and sort of, I think that one of the most important pieces in navigating a journey with a, after diagnosis of sarcoma is, is just having the connection with your care team that feels right to you. And whether that's with a woman or with a man or, or just with a certain personality type or someone in a certain geographic region because of the stress of travel or someone with a certain background and expertise, whatever that is for the patient is what should be sort of the focus and should be what drives that relationship. So I, I don't, you know, yes, I have had women have said to me that they wanted a woman provider, but I also have, I have, I, I have plenty of men that I see um, as well. Um, and I think it's, it's just sort of what's the right fit between the patient and the provider. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm gonna ask Tracy, how you're, you're a nurse. And so you deal a lot with like the side effects of treatment and things like that, the tolerability. Have you noticed or anybody noticed over the years if there's any kind of gender differences um, I know that we, we know about ifosamide, for example, that um, you, know, you have a, a little bit of increased risk of the neurotoxicity uh, in females, um, uh, and, but again, multifactorial about lower protein levels and such. Do you, do you have anybody notice any gender differences in tolerability of, of treatments? I think um, over the years, I would agree with Dr. George that, you know, it tends to kind of be more of a personality thing, although there's a, you know, a drug approved for just recently that I'm sure many of you know about um, that has kind of a unique side effect for the GIST um, drug profile. And that is some, can be some significant hair thinning. Um, it's not, you know, complete hair, hair loss, but um, I will say that that one tends to bother the women uh, more. And so as I, you know, counsel patients on that piece of it, it's a different uh, conversation for the women. Um, you know, there's maybe a societal sort of stigma for women having thinner hair. And so we're talking about wigs and, you know, head coverings and those kind of things. Um, the other aspect that I come upon that really isn't a gender issue is more the division of sort of working or not working. Um, and so maybe a younger population versus an older population. And I, we do sort of have to structure our um, side effect management to sort of how active someone is, or, you know, are they trying to get to work every day? And does that fatigue bother them or that hand foot syndrome, those kind of things. Um, but that would be across the board and really wouldn't have a gender specific focus. Okay, good. Well, actually I got some, some um, questions through the, panelists. So uh, let's ask, there was a patient, this is some patient related questions. Um, 
So, you know, we'll, we'll switch it up. So this is patient's a 39 year old woman and she was recently diagnosed with stage two GIST cancer, eight centimeter tumor removed from her small bowel. And the oncologists are um, wanting me to start uh, three years of imatinib 400. And she asked for a second opinion and she has one at Mayo on Monday. And so she wants to know if there's anything that she should do um, uh, for you know what she should ask them and what needs to be done. So uh, why don't I go with, with Dr. George on this one? Oh, sure. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's always a good idea to get a second opinion if you have any questions and that you just want to get another opportunity to sort of process new information. Um, so I think that sounds like a good next step. In terms of um, what to do ahead of time, I mean, it's on Monday, so that's just a couple days. You know, the most important things when we see patients for consults is just making sure that the records have arrived. I suspect that that's all already been taken care of for you, but it, it might not be a bad idea just to do sort of one final double check with the team at Mayo to be sure they have everything that they need so that when you go, they'll be able to have as most comprehensive history as possible to give you the most um, detailed uh, assessment and recommendation for next steps. And when I say records, it means, you know, not just making sure that they have the, the um, you know, the, the notes from your doctors, the surgical notes, the pathology reports, the radiology uh, imaging reports, um, but also talk to them about how they get the discs so that the, so that the team at Mayo can actually look at the images um, from your prior, if you had a prior CAT scan or something like that. I think that's one of the things that there's often a, um, a glitch on when people come to see us is they say, oh, we, we thought you had everything. We sent the scan reports, but somehow there was like a disconnect in communication about making sure the actual disc arrived or the images. Because most of us that do these types of consults will want to actually look at the scans ourselves. So I think that's one thing you could do. Another thing you could do is just make sure you understand what their visitor policy is in the current COVID era. If they do have you come with a, a patient, um, they do have you come with a, if they allow you to bring a visitor, um, that you and your visitor know sort of what to expect going through the process. Um, and then any questions that you might have or anything that's on the back of, you know, in the front or the back of your mind that you want to be sure are answered. And actually, Annette just brought up the important piece, which is to make sure, oh, oh, I thought what you were going to say is actually just to make sure that you have your pathology reviewed too, um, which is, which is a standard part of any consultation um, in all the records. So, um, and they'll talk to you about you know, if you need to have, if, if genotyping has been done, you know, what kind of special tests need to be done to your pathology. Um, but I would imagine that that will be brought up in the context of the consult uh, for just what we really like to do is look, make sure the diagnosis is correct. And then also to um, look for the activating mutation, the driver mutation, because that may impact the recommendations for Gleevec or imatinib. This one I think you had a second part of the question of what's your day to day going to be like oh, on a yeah. matinib. So maybe I'll, I can turn that over to someone else because I've been talking a lot. <laughs> um, I don't know, Nita, so, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, so the question is what is the day to day like on a matinib? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I see that day to day life. Well, you know, um, I would say majority of patients uh, are actually fairly lucky where. What we hope to do is that we can have minimal impact to their quality of life uh, if they're staying on a drug that is kind of going to be chronic uh, use. So yes, they can expect some side effects. You know, you, you can expect side effects that are common, like some fluid retention that actually can wax and wane over the period of your time on imatinib, and your doctor can definitely discuss with you ways to make that better, especially if the swelling is more. Uh, you also can have, you know, these Charlie horse cramps or joint aches that come and go uh, that, you know, again, your uh, treatment, your team can give you a lot of uh, insights as to how to manage it or deal with it better. Um, you know, there could be some fatigue. Some people have some nausea, but those things can be very, you know, easily managed by, uh, you know, making sure you take it with meals. Some people prefer to stick to the evening time to take their medicines, but some then switch to the morning time because that works better for them. Diarrhea is another thing that needs to be managed. Uh, again, 
Some people will be able to, you know, won't need any medication to manage it, and some do. So in all, I mean, I think you should be very hopeful as you get started uh, with imatinib, hoping that your, you know, side effects will be very manageable and it shouldn't impact your day-to-day too much. Uh, and whatever it is, you can work with your team to get them fairly well controlled. Again, if you're somebody who does have a, a higher level of side effects with imatinib, then over time, you know, uh, your physician can definitely discuss with you what avenues you have in order to mitigate those side effects to make your quality of life better. Yeah, I'm going to switch up. I think this question from Joan uh, looks interesting. I'm going to put Annette in the hot seat because um, she is a GIST researcher. Um, so I'm a GIST res- I'm a researcher and GIST is my third cancer. I'm curious as to how the panelists decided to go into the fields as they did. I'm also a diabetic and my thesis research was in diabetes labs. Since then I've worked in many fields and I do think my personal bias and interests do play a part. So we'll start with Annette, how she got interested and if anybody else has any personal stories of why they chose sarcoma and GIST. Yeah, so hi. Um, I guess I didn't even my field really other than I was always interested in cancer research and um, that's uh, what cancer research and genetics actually and that's what initially drove me to Jonathan Fletcher's lab at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and he was also majorly a cytogeneticist at that time with an interest in sarcomas but it's just so happened that At the time that I was there, um, essentially everything happened that needed to happen for just uh, the driver gene mutations and the kit gene were identified and um, the therapeutic targeting with imatinib or Gleevec was also identified. And while I was there, the first patient was treated at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute next door, essentially. And that drove the entire lab essentially into just research. And that's where I stayed <laughs> and still am just, I'm uh, branching out a little bit to other sarcomas, but that's what put me into sarcoma research. And I might add um, also that uh, since I am um, a physician, but have not worked in the clinic or diagnostics since I came to Jonathan Fletcher's lab, essentially um, in uh, 1999, um, What helped me connect it to the patients and what I really love about my job is uh, the connections to the patient organizations uh, like Life Raft Group um, and others that operate um, essentially globally, um, but also to smaller uh, patient groups that um, we have in our own community. So uh, I really feel the connection and uh, by meeting the patients and doing something uh, what we're doing today, speaking to you um, as a panelist, um, that give me, gives me really reason to keep do, on doing what I'm doing. So to really try to bring the research from the lab into the clinic. All right, so we have a lot of medical questions, so we might as well, I mean, we're all doctors and nurses and social workers. So we, so let's, uh, let's just ask these, I, I'll throw away my other question. No, we'll maybe keep some of the questions, but um, these are good. Okay, so this is for, uh, well, anyone can answer actually, but if just returns, how is it determined whether to treat with medicine or surgery? Maybe we'll ask the surgeon. We can have a debate whether we should treat with medicine or surgery, or we have the radiologist. We could just zap it. <laughs> okay. I think you're on mute. You're on mute. Mute, yeah. Yes. So, yes. Uh... So how do we decide between medicine and and surgery? Yeah, if it recurs, if it comes back, what do we do? Yeah, so that, um, uh, you know, is always a question because surgery is really always good if there's like one spot and you can take it out and and there's nothing else. So that's when we always think about whether it's curative or not. And so when the tumors come back, we're really asking ourselves, first of all, is surgery safe? And then do we have a really good chance of being able to get it all out so um, and keep the disease under control with the medications that we have. So in those cases, patients, the patients who do best with surgery are patients who maybe have the disease come back just in one spot or two spots. Um, and when the disease doesn't come back for a long period of time and 
and when the disease is relatively small and you can get it out safely. So those are some of the main things we, we always think about. We also think about whether or not we have medications that if we can't get everything out and if they're, if they're spots that are left behind that are gonna help keep what we leave behind under control, then surgery makes a lot of sense as well. So, so those are the kind of things I think about when I'm deciding about whether I can help somebody with surgery or whether I need to th send them for really medical therapy when the disease comes back. And, um, and also, as someone asked, if my tumor hasn't changed since a diagnosis of a, a year and a half ago, no surgery yet. Is it is it safe to put off the surgery as long as the tumor isn't changing? I'm on a Um it, uh, Is that for me? Oh, whoever. Yeah, if you want, <laughs> if you want to answer, I can answer it. Where? Um, I mean, I can answer this one, and I think we'll see what everybody else you know, I want to see what the group thinks about this. You know, I think it, it's all going to be dependent on where the, where the tumor is. If, if the imatinib is working and we're showing that it's not active, with, which you can, we can ask actually um, Dr. Brody to a little bit in more detail about how she can tell on a scan whether, you know, how it's active uh, or not, um, you know, is it, is it safe to get it out? What would be the repercussions of it being removed if it's in, if it's occupying the stomach and it would involve to remove the entire stomach? Um, you know, then it's not that it's not worth it to do the surgery if it can get smaller and maybe you know save the stomach. So I think it's going to be dependent on where it where it is um, to to really say um, you know whether it's safe leaving it in as long as it's not active, you know, presumably, you know, is, is okay. But yes, there is a risk that it could, it could build up some um, resistance. So why don't we ask Dr. Brody to a little bit, discuss a little bit further about the imaging. You're on mute too. <laughs> We're diligent on the mute. And there we are. So I'm going to show a couple slides because I'm a, I'm a picture doctor, if you don't mind. I always tell my, uh, my kids that I'm the picture doctor. So uh, I'm going to quickly show a couple pictures so you'll get a better idea of what, what we're looking for. Um, just to let you know, I'm the radiologist, the picture doctor. I interpret the images. Obviously, all the doctors here also look at the images. What we mostly use is CT in GIST anyway, CT, PET CT, and MRI. That will vary depending on the type of tumor, what the tumor looks like, uh, and the physician preference. Uh, far and away, though, the workhorse of GIST is really a CT, computed axial tomography. Most of you have seen CT before. It really entails um, a patient lying on a table, and then that table glides through this big donut, and this donut takes a picture. So every time the patient moves through the, um, through the donut, it takes a picture, and at about every millimeter. Then it takes all these pictures, and it uh, creates a computer-generated image, these slices, and we look at them and, uh, and make diagnoses. So this is one patient where those are just from the wall of the stomach. You can see this is the um, liver in blue. This is the stomach. And coming off of that is a mass, and that's the gist. Uh, for liver metastases, uh, it looks like this. This is the stomach. And then we see these black dots in the liver. And these are the metastases. So, Response to treatment is really what you're asking me about. And traditionally, we've always thought of um, decrease in size as being the thing that means that you've responded. But uh, just ultimately, most of them will get smaller, but it can take a very long time. So just do other things. They get flatter and they get a little bit darker and they can get black and even very, very big. So I like to think of it sort of as starting off with the turger of a gummy bear and then we melt the gummy bear uh, and it gets, uh, it looks like it gets larger, but it's really just getting more liquidy. This is what it looks like before treatment. Very bright, lots of vessels in here, soaking up the uh, contrast we've given. And then after treatment gets darker, blacker, and flatter. Here's another case where we've treated it and it got darker, but it got bigger. And believe it or not, it's actually, um, it's actually responding. So CT gives us a lot of information. Uh, it's very quick but there's some issues with contrast allergies, radiation, uh, and obviously some scans are not definitive. And that's when we move on to PET-CT. Uh, PET is a functional study and we usually pair it with 
CT because that will tell us where the abnormality is inside the body. So this is what the PET CT machine looks like and it looks like the big sister of the CT machine. And PET's based on some very basic principles that cells in the body use glucose for sugar, for energy, and that cells that are very active use a lot of glucose and therefore cancer cells because they're very active use a lot of glucose. So we take some fluorine 18, which is, uh, a, is, has a little bit of radiation to it. We mix it with the glucose and we create this FDG. This is what we give the patient. We give the patient this special sugar. That sugar is taken up by all the cells in the body and we use a special picture gamma camera to take pictures. So cells with a lot of FDG or a lot of sugar uptake look bright. So this is what the CT looks like. This is what the PET looks like. And then we have very special software that merges the two. Um, and we can see therefore that that bright area right there is an active tumor. It's taking up a lot of sugar. Uh, and right next to it, you can see one of those dark circles next to it, which is one that has actually been treated. It's not bright, it's sort of the melted gummy bear. So it's whole body, it's, it, you know, it's really nice, gives us a good troubleshooter, takes a little bit longer, still uses some radiation. So we've, a lot of people have moved on more towards MRI. It's particularly helpful in brain, spine, muscle, bone, and other sarcoma types, uh, and it does not use any radiation. You can see this is what a CT looks like. Um, gives us a lot of grays and blacks, but a lot more grays and blacks with the MRI, so it gives us a lot more information. Doesn't use any radiation, can better characterize some tumors, and we're starting to look at whole body MRI, but people can claustrophobic, it takes a lot longer, so it's hard for patients to lie still. So they will often move and degrade the images and some patients with metal uh, and pacemakers can't get them. So um, that's really basically it. I just wanted to show you that. That just shows what your choices are, lots of choices. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was, that was really good. We're going to borrow those slides. <laughs> I may keep them just, to, I, I, that's a really good explanation. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, as long as it's not active, as long as it's not, um, you know, getting bigger or, uh, or showing those changes, I think it's safe to keep it in. If removing it would cause, uh, you know, uh, would be unsafe. Um, and I think that, uh, anybody else I think I have another question here that was actually pretty this is for the this is we have Marlene who's our who's my social worker at Miami I also call her a miracle worker most social workers I call miracle workers because they can find stuff and help people where no one else can um, and so I have a patient a question here how can I see a doctor if my insurance won't pay so do we, or maybe we even ask Sarah about this. Um, it, what are some of the ways that we can get to see the patients or get to see doctors with so, insurance issues? Hi. So the first thing I would do is uh, try to find out what, what facility you're going to and find out what insurances are approved at that facility. To find out what insurances you are um, able to be approved for. But my question is, does the patient, does, does they have insurance or they don't have insurance? I mean, I think let's say they didn't have insurance, but they were diagnosed with a cancer. What are some of the resources so, that they, that they can it, do? Okay, so it depends on the situation. So if the patient like lost their job for whatever reason, or they're unable to work, they're always eligible to apply at the marketplace. They can apply for insurance that is eligible for all patients if they lose their job, if they're unable to work, that's always an option. In the event that they're not eligible for the marketplace because they weren't working, there's always um, the ability to apply for a Medicaid. And then I, I often do that with patients. I often step in and help them with that process, guide them, navigate them to the Medicaid office so that they can actually complete their application. Mm -hmm. That's the next option. It takes a little bit of time. It's not right away but that's the best option. A third option, worst case scenario, if they need treatment immediately, is to check the local hospitals, like the county hospitals, because sometimes they do have financial assistance departments where the patients um, get assisted and then they can get their treatment at that hospital in the meantime while they wait for their actual insurance if for whatever reason they have to wait for November for open enrollment. Good, okay. all right. Um... 
that. Can, Thank I, you. can I also jump in? Yes, yes, let's jump um, in. You can argue if there's no gist, a spe, a, a, an oncologist who specializes in gist, and you're located in a place where they don't understand what gist is, and you need to go see a specialist, um, you can present your case to your insurance company. I need to see a specialist, and there aren't any specialists on your list of providers. And we have seen that patients have had success with that. So if you do have an insur insurance, the person who's asking this question, and the physician that you want to see is a specialist, and that um, and your insurance isn't accepted there, fight. We tell patients all the time, fight with your insurance company and do not just take no once. Keep fighting it to the end. And we've had people that have fought for a year and have won. So that's what I would recommend. And the, and the only thing I would add to that actually is you should call the place that you want to be seen at. Right. And sometimes they can help you to navigate, particularly around this point of specialization sometimes they can help you to navigate with your insurance. Even if it's just for like a one-time consult, like a place to start um, and then see if you can get the one-time consult, figure out what the treatment plan needs to be. And then if there needs to be ongoing care, then there can be more appeals and, and negotiations. And I think then that's true. I see Amy nodding and Nita nodding. And I think, you know, I think that, you know, a lot of us um, have people that are in that same situation. The other thing is that if you try to go to a place and, and for whatever reason that place, you just can't get there because of the challenges with your insurance, then sometimes that place can give you a recommendation of somebody in your area that may be more likely to be on your insurance. So I would still suggest reaching out to that place that, that you feel that you want to go to and they can also help. And the Life Raft Group is another great resource for different experts around the around the country that um, might not be on your radar just yet. And um, I'm also a just member of that, that. Oh, sorry. Uh, just real quick. I'm, I'm also on the board of the Sarcoma Alliance and we do raise, we um, give funds out to patients that need a second opinion if their insurance doesn't cover it or for travel. Um, so you can always try to apply for those programs as well. Um, some of the other um, uh, sarcoma groups have funds to, to help to get to an expert. So uh, all these are good. Thank you. And and I can, one other small off. thing, not to linger on this topic for too long, but the other thing is to give patients some sort of, uh, to be proactive as much as they can. This is a longer term suggestion, but as you think about, you know, every year your open enrollment comes along and you're thinking about, should I be on my insurance or my husband or my partner's insurance? Um, if there's a choice, try and think ahead a little bit. And if you know you want to go see, you know, Dr. George, um, then, you know, kind of what is the network that her clinic might, you know, be taking patients and is there an option for you to kind of uh, move your insurance into that uh, as you, you know, as you have that choice and just kind of keeping ahead of the game a little bit so that you're, you have more choices um, if and when you need them. All right, we have some, we have some really good questions here. I'm like, which one do I ask now? Uh, so <laughs> uh, I want to answer all of them. Now. Okay, what about is there any progress um, toward being able to use liquid biopsy for just surveillance? So maybe if we just want to talk a little bit about um, where we are in the liquid biopsy uh, realm, um, and and then what about sur surveillance? So anyone want to take the lead on it, or should I just point out somebody. What about Dr. George or Annette? Do you, are you, uh, what kind of, no. Okay. All right. We'll go with, we're putting Dr. George in the hot seat. Uh oh, what else He's in the middle of my, uh, that's oh, no. <laughs> of my panel here. Can you just repeat the question again? Okay. So what kind of progress is there about liquid biopsy oh. or just surveillance? So just maybe talk a little bit about, you know, what, what yeah. we do before and then talk about the surveillance. Yeah. So right now, I mean, you know, it's interesting. So I'll give my impression and then I would be in, in, interested in others as well. Cause I think that this is really an area that's evolving and Gina, you might even have a different, um, you know, in Miami, you guys probably use it a bit differently uh, than we yeah. do. Um, so 
my opinion is that this is still an area of active investigation and research. Um, it's liquid biopsies. And for those of you that don't know, basically liquid biopsies is sort of a, a different term that we use for identifying tumor DNA that's in the plasma. So that's circulating. So the theory is that, you, you know, you draw a tube of blood, you look to see if you can find the DNA that the tumor is shedding. And then does that tell you something about the disease status or response or resistance or activity of the disease or something like that? This is an area that has really probably progressed the most in lung cancer in terms of commercial utility of and proven benefit of how to use the test, but it's a huge area of research across oncology generally. In GIST, it would be um, in our center, we are not using it outside of research purposes. We are still, we feel that in our opinion, it's still an area that we have to understand how to use not only a positive test, but also a negative test. And um, that's really the issue in, in my view is that, you know, what does a negative test mean? Is it really negative or is it just that the test isn't sensitive or specific enough to pick up the DNA there? Um, for now, we use imaging definitively as like our assessment of disease status. Um, and there may become a time where ctDNA or this type of test complements imaging to try to get a sense of the mutational landscape of the disease progression or stability. But as of right now, we are still considering it as an investigational option. We're integrating it on our trials. We're reviewing many data sets along with many others here. But I personally, we're not using it as a surveillance tool because we just think it hasn't, it, it's not sensitive or specific enough yet. But I'll let Amy talk and, and Nita and Annette, anybody else, please chime in. And Gina, you guys use it, I know. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, you yeah, know, I mean, the I, thing I, is, yeah, well, let's go with, yeah, let's go with Nita first. Okay, no, I was just going to say, I mean, I completely echo what you said, Suzanne. Um, I don't think it's there yet for surveillance, because we really don't know a negative test, uh, you know, is truly negative. I think where we're, I mean, I'm kind of using it, but more so to collect data, not to use instead of scans. So it's not that, and I'm using it more in patients who have disease, just as you said, to kind of look at their mutational landscape, because if you do get the test, uh, the ctDNA results back, and you see various uh, mutations, uh, it might help you predict what drugs to use next uh, when you see progression but I don't think it's there yet for surveillance. I have some very, very proactive patients who do this on their own and get their results uh, on surveillance and share them with me, but it's not something that I really recommend doing because yeah, we're not there for surveillance yet. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, what we found is that, um, that if there's not enough tumor, it just isn't specific enough to detect uh, if there's only a minute amount of tumor. Now, hopefully we're hoping that technology, we're, we're gonna put, you know, Annette to task her with this, to come up with the technology where we can detect it before it's seen on the images. But, you know, it takes about a billion cells and Dr. Brody will correct me if I'm wrong about a billion cells to see a centimeter. Maybe I've made that number up, but uh, please correct me if I'm wrong because I always use that number. But anyways, um, so, uh, you know, so we have to be able to detect it less than that. and We just don't have the ability at this time. But if it, but to help us, we can use it to help us sometimes when we're trying to change treatment, if a mutation is detected, um, then it's helpful. But if a mutation's not detected, it's not helpful. So that means usually you have to have a lot of, a lot of um, cells in the body to be able to detect it. But we are going to be having some exciting information, maybe presented at CTOS this year with some of the data that we had in our propritinib trial um, that, uh, that Dr. George is leading, um, uh, where we do have some data on, on that information. So that will be helpful. And as we do clinical trials and we collect this information in, in clinical trials, then we can really learn a lot. Yeah, just to maybe got, uh, really, really quickly chime in, um, obviously, um, so the reason that I did not want to answer this question was because I don't have the connection to the clinic, um, and I don't really know how 
everyone actually thinks about it in, in, with respect to patient use, but I think everyone does agree that uh, just like lung cancer or specific types of lung cancer that are uh, driven by a single mutation is one of the really ideal tumors to use this on. And um, as you've heard from all the panelists, um, yes, I mean, we can really learn from it and it's probably there for us in the future, but we just need to have more data and potentially some better tests. See, we have several questions about um, CT scans and contrast. So I don't know, Dr. Brody, if you've read these um, or if you want me to read them about the questions with the CT scans and the contrast. You're on mute. <laughs> okay, let me read some of the uh, questions here. Uh, the, the CT, oh, so I had a CT scan at four different facilities and each had a different prep about the uh, one was in liquid, one was a cocktail, one was plain, and which one do they think, which is the best contrast? And then also, like, what about the comment of the scan frequency? Maybe we can have some a surgeon or a, about when do we, you know, how frequent, especially on surveillance, um, and which contrast is better um, about the, you know, with kidney problems, long-term effects of the kidney. So it's, it's very variable and there is really a culture to every radiology department to some degree. Um, but I think we, for CTs, uh, there, especially through Hopkins, there's been a lot of talk about uh, in terms of the oral contrast, just using water, that that's the best. Uh, and that intravenous contrast mixed with negative contrast or water is probably the best way to visualize really almost any CT. Um, in terms of the frequency, um, there are NCCN guidelines that will tell you when you, when you should be imaged. Usually uh, after PET, it's somewhere about, eight, usually it's about eight weeks, but it will vary depending on how you're responding, what your oncologist wants. It's really sort of a, um, a group decision to some degree about how we scan. Um, in terms of MRI, I think there's been a lot of talk. Of, so, so with CT, if your kidney function is beyond a certain level, we don't like to use that kind of contrast. So now we've been recommending more MRI, which for a while we had stopped doing that because we were concerned that that contrast was building up in patients with kidney failure. But it turns out that we have learned that there's a special group called group two contrast we use Doderm at our institution, and that seems to be the most common. That is not does not hang that does not dissociate in the body and cause damage to the um, to the soft tissue. So now, if, as long as you're using one of those type two agents, it should not matter what your kidney function is. Um, it's important that you know what kind of uh, MRI contrast you're using, uh, I, especially if you're going to get at a certain center, especially if you're going to get multiple scans. So I hope that answers your questions. CT, it's, it's beyond a certain point. We don't give it. MRI, we will give the contrast, but we want to make sure that it's the safe kind of contrast, the safest kind of contrast. I think that's, I think that answered the question, uh, Dr. D'Amato. <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> I know I'm on mute. You know, uh, you know, my multitasking skills are being tested right now. That's apparently it's supposed to be a female attribute, but I don't know. Maybe I, uh, maybe I just didn't get that one. Uh, but so actually, this uh, there's a there's a question from Facebook Live. Uh, can we go over the care for those with recurrent SDH deficient wild type gist? That's a that's a handful. That's a tough one. Uh, we have some, uh, Dr. George, you're involved in some of the research there. You're on mute, by the way. Yeah, sure, okay. absolutely. Um, actually, before we talk about that, Annette, do you wanna talk about what SDH deficient GIST is and how it's yes. different than regular kit mutant GIST? But you're, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll talk about the therapeutics. And then, you know, we can talk about the therapeutics. Yeah, sure. While I was talking, I was looking for, for where my cursor is. <laughs> so, yeah, so as most of you guys um, have um, heard from, from your doctor um, and your own research, uh, that most. Um, Kid mutant just, uh, is driven by this, this mutant in, in the kid gene uh, that codes for the kid protein and that drives a certain um, signaling pathway in the cell to 
uh, proliferate. Um, but then there's a, a second group of GIST, and uh, a lot of those are occurring in um, younger patients, and some of them also in more female patients to um, actually uh, not give a nod to, to our theme today, uh, that have not those kit mutations, uh, but have either mutations or somehow perturbations that get, um, lead to um, the non-expression of, of another uh, protein in, in your cell, and that has nothing most of direct to do with the kit protein. Uh, it sits in your uh, little energy uh, parts of the cell in the mitochondria. And uh, what that does, uh, it's not entirely clear now because of what it does to a cell to become a gist cell, although we do have some clues. Uh, so unfortunately, um, this mutation or this perturbation to for cells not to have this protein um, cannot be targeted by Gleevec uh, because it's just a different protein, it's, it does different things. Um, so that poses a question uh, for our clinical oncologists how to treat those patients. Um, we are pretty sure as pathologists that these, um, at th this point at least, are still being called GIST. Uh, because those tumors do express the kit protein, like if you under if you you can use a special stain that you can look at under the microscope, and you can say so. The pathologist would say this looks kind of the same as a kit mutant chest, uh, but then the genetic basis of it is is totally different. In fact, actually, the the SDF, SDH mutant just do look a little bit uh, different under the microscope, uh, but let's not get into that. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. So basically, you know, I, I just, you know, in terms of what Annette said, most GIST are driven by mutations in KIT or it's sort of cousin protein Peter Jeff receptor alpha. And, uh, but there's a subset about 10% that don't have that driving, that driver mutation in one of those genes. And those historically used to be called wild type because the KIT and Peter Jeff receptor alpha genes were not mutated in the, and therefore they were wild type. So one of the more common subtypes of wild type GIST is this group of GIST called SDH deficient GIST, which just as Annette said, is sort of a, a group that's defined instead of by alterations in KIT for Peter Jeff receptor alpha, um, typically have something, have an alteration in one of the subunits of this particular uh, genetic, these, this kind of machinery, SDH. Um, there's, I'm not going to go into the details of the different kinds of alterations one can have, but but what it leads to is lack of expression of this protein, and therefore the tumor is called SDH deficient GIST. SDH deficient GIST is really different because it tends to occur, just like Bennett said, in younger people, it tends to have a female predominance, and it tends to be very indolent, so it can grow very slowly over many years. That isn't the case for everybody, and that isn't the case for everybody over their entire disease course, but it can just behave differently than regular, more common a kit mutant gist. The other important thing, even though I didn't talk about treatment yet, but I think one of the important things about SDH deficient gist is that some people with SDH deficient gist have a mutation or an alteration in the SDH gene, not just in the cells of the gist, but they may also have what's called a germline alteration in, in one of the SDH subunits. So that's a, an alteration in, in the gene that's in all the cells of your body. And because of that, there's a potentially a predisposition to other types of growths. Um, and so for anybody that we see, and I think this is the case across most of the big centers, is that people that have SDH deficient GIST, we often will send them for genetic counseling to look to see if they have one of these germline mutations in SDH, not just in their GIST cell, but in all of their cells, because that might imp imply some additional screening tests that might need to be done, not just for themselves, but potentially for family members as well. In terms of treatment, I'll just take two seconds and talk about it and then others can chime in. But, you know, we, there's debate in this area, actually, and, and, and you guys at OHSU might think slightly differently. You know, it used to be some people don't use imatinib at all in this disease because the response rate, meaning shrinkage rate, is um, reported like as in one patient, maybe at one center once or twice. Um, so, which is really different than regular, you know, kit mutant gist. 
Um, and so many of us will start with some of the second and third line therapies like sunitinib or regorafenib, where there have been um, more patients that have been shown to actually have tumor shrinkage. There are a number of studies uh, that are in development specifically for this subtype of GIST. And the other key thing about SDH deficient GIST in my view is when do you even need to treat it? Because it can stay very indolent for long periods of time. And the drugs that we use can be toxic over long periods of time. I'm talking five, six, seven years. Um, so it's really about making sure that you match the, treat, the timing of treatment intervention with the need for treatment intervention as well. So I'll stop there. Nita, I don't know, do you have anything or Tracy that, that you guys wanna add? And actually, Amy, I think this is a whole different situation around surgery, perhaps, than some of the other gists. But I don't know, Gina, I'll stop now. No, I mean, I, I, not much to add, except I, I totally agree. And as you said, uh, it's probably more of the other TKIs other than imatinib that have some of the, they're like a little bit more dirty TKIs. They attack a lot more things. Uh, they do, you know, have, that's why they have a few higher side effects, but they do tend to work a little better. So we even if somebody is on imatinib, uh, we'll check for response, but we very quickly move to sunitinib or, you know, we've seen better responses with regorafenib. And just as you said, we're always looking out for clinical trials or newer therapies in that, in that subset. But, and important to get uh, a complete genotyping done if you do not have a KIT or PDGFR uh, mutation identified in your GIST. So um, I just realized that we're running over. Oh, I mean, that's per usual. I'm always running late and running over and not looking at the time. But um, so, um, and I realized we didn't answer everybody's questions. Um, and so I'll ask Sarah, maybe she's going to talk to the IT people about figuring out how we can get these questions answered. Yep. So for those who we could not answer, we will um, reach out to the appropriate panelists to see if we can get uh, a response and then send it to you. Um, we will be posting this um, session on our website. So those who could not make it could um, listen in um, at their own leisure. Um, but also more importantly, this is a series. So October 26th, we're gonna be having um, uh, case presentations by a few experts, um, and that should be um, a really interactive discussion as well. And then um, at the end of the year, we plan to host a virtual gala honoring um, the women who've made a difference um, in the sarcoma field. Um, so uh, we've also reached out to some of the other sarcoma groups to nominate um, women. So. Uh, you know, uh, our community, please send, uh, please stay tuned for announcements about that. We're really excited um, for that event. Um, but we don't see this as a standalone um, thing. So, uh, you know, if, if anybody has any recommendations or questions after this event, please feel free to reach out to the LifeRef group and we'll do our best to, to answer your questions. Um, so I just want to thank all the panelists today uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedules to um, to join us. I, I think um, it's remarkable to hear everybody's opinion and, and, and I think it really speaks to how important it is to have a multidisciplinary team to, um, to be seeing these patients. And I think each of the women on these panel offers a very unique perspective and, and experience in that role. So um, thank you to everybody for joining today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at the next event in October. Thank so you. long, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thanks, Bye. And thanks, Sarah. Bye. Thank you guys so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.